Up next is Ed, Ed Anderson, who is DevOps. Yeah. And he loves functions. Yep. All right. Ready? Yeah, let's do it. Go. All right, so I'm Ed Anderson. I'm the DevOps manager at a company called RealSelf up in Seattle. I do love functions. I like uh, functions as a service. Some people call it serverless. Some people call it Jeff because those first two things don't actually mean anything. So a little story. In 2015, my place of employment went to our cloud providers mega conference where our VP of engineering attended this uh, session on functions and he wrote this little API gateway that ran some node code and he was like, holy crap, this is a thing of the future. Everybody get on this right right now, and we tried. We, uh, we brought it back home where it met reality, right? We had to integrate it with existing APIs in our company. We had to integrate it with our existing authentication scheme. We had to do something new for secrets because our secret management system didn't actually work in functions. And we spent uh, a lot of time learning, and in the end, the project did not work, even though it's just code, as we all know from the marketing material. So yeah, that was really uh, it was really a barrier for success for us. I mean, we had to learn too many things. We had a quick deadline. In the end, it didn't come together. Uh, that project got scrapped. Oh crap! So now my company, we use actually zero uh, sysadmin. VMs. We do all of our administrivia with functions, and I think that's something you can do now in my company. We know how to operate this, and we use it. So let me ask you a question. Who's got a cron box? Who's ever taken a webhook? Feel free to raise your hands. Uh, <laughs> all of these things are great starts for using functions because they're not mission critical in the general case. So the first barrier for you adopting this is going to be to find simple use cases. We used webhooks. We used sysadmin glue, um, and we learned how to operationalize this. We did like cluster backups, things that don't fit well into configuration management. Second barrier, you got to love your cloud. You got to know your cloud. It is true, you can run code without worrying about servers, but you're going to move a lot of that uh, heavy lifting out to your cloud. The third barrier you're going to find is going to be cost. Uh, if you take a function that needs one gig of RAM that runs for one second every second for a month, that's going to cost you 36 bucks. Sounds cheap, right? Change the runtime to five seconds, it goes up over 200 bucks a month. Change the runtime to 10 seconds, it's 425. You're running instances cheaper than that, right? So it's not perfect. It's good. There are some other barriers to adoption that you're going to use. When you start using FAS, you know what I see in your future? Deploy, observe, deploy, observe, deploy, observe. In your future, I see rough edges, like learning what your cloud means by at least once invocation semantics. <clears throat> you're going to get other, other surprises, like in local dev. Say your object store doesn't actually pass the binary content of a new file, and it passes a message to your code. Do you think you can create that in local dev? I bet not. Uh, you get other problems, like CI looks a little bit different, deployment looks a little bit different, log aggregation looks a little bit different, and if you don't know how to observe what's happening with this stuff, it's going to burn you, friends. So you get other things, like you get weird cloud code smells, your level four network config permeates through all of the code that you write in all of your deployments. You get weird things, like the global scope of functions actually persists between runs under certain conditions. Surprise! <coughs> Yeah, so why do this? This sounds terrible, right? Well, it's really not that bad. <laughs> Under many conditions, it is cheaper. Uh, and the operating model, once you understand it, it's pretty compelling, even for those of us that are tasked with operations. Imagine a world where knowing Unix isn't a prerequisite to success. Imagine a world where you don't have to update OpenSSL three times a month on every machine you run. Imagine a world where your exposure lies entirely in the code that you run. Imagine a world where you get DDoS protection for free from your cloud. There's things you can do for zero dollars if they run for infrequent periods, tell your boss, hey, boss, we can do this thing. It'll cost us zero dollars a month. In your imagination, make that a revenue generating event for your company. Sounds kind of appealing, right? In my cloud, there's 16 different major classifications of triggers to invoke functions. Message appears on queue. You can run code. Email gets brought in. You can send that directly to code. And if you're super crazy, database updates can run code. <laughs> There's other weird little tricks, like once you get to using these things, you'll find you actually don't have to send your own code in at all. You can pipe the API, the uh, HTTP gateway, directly into the object store and bypass all of the built-in authentication on that. But <clears throat> the line between our code and our cloud's code is 
disappearing in the future. So my advice to you, find a framework that configures your cloud and deploys your code at the same time. You're gonna be doing that a whole lot. Find something that is um, declarative and idempotent because you will totally be deploying all the time. And where we're going, there will be hashtag no ops. There will be hashtag no devs. There's hashtag no security. It's all just one thing, trying to get something done for your business. That's the end. <laughs>